Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international studies, produced under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association, and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Professor of Global Politics and Associate Provost at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with an engaged and innovative teacher of international relations. The goal? to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by exploring how the energies that animate thoughtful teaching pay dividends for both students and teachers. Conversations about teaching global studies can help all of us find the joy in our classrooms, elevating emotions that students find contagious. Today's conversation is with Dr. Eric Leonard, Professor of Political Science and Hinkle Family Chair in International Affairs at Shenandoah University. Eric has edited a textbook for teaching international relations theory. He's run Shenandoah's general education program and brought many pedagogical innovations to their campus. Our conversation explores how flipped classroom techniques can help undergraduate students of all levels energize their learning, unpacks assessment structures that transparently focus both instructor and student attention on learning how to learn through engaging the complexities of global politics and challenges the academic hierarchies between scholarship and teaching that can leave those of us who devote significant energies to the latter feeling insufficiently part of our discipline. Eric Leonard, welcome to The Teaching Curve. So glad you were able to make time for us to talk to you about this important stuff you've been working on, and uh, and it's great to talk to you. Uh, Fantastic to be here. Uh, Have loved all the episodes leading up to this, so I was... uh, I was honored to be asked to be on here and always good to talk with you, Jamie. So the first thing we always do, as you know from watching the other episodes, is talk a little bit about where you are by asking you to describe the people who make you a teacher. And that that is the students at Shenandoah University. So can you tell us about them? Okay. Um, So a lot of my students, especially the intro classes, are health profession majors. They have no interest in politics. Uh, They're typically there because this course fulfills one of their gen eds. We also have a lot of first generation students who um, struggle a little bit with college and the adjustment and things like that. Um, And so it's important to recognize their needs and how can we can assist them and and give them ways to be successful in, in, in college. Um, I usually teach six to seven courses a year, and it's rare that I have a double prep even within the year. Um, So it's typically split split between the intro and the upper level courses. Can you just give us a little history, your own personal history, and how you've been teaching for the last couple decades? How I teach and what I do in the classroom is influenced by where I came from. And my personal history is not the typical history of many of us that are in the profession. As a two-time college dropout, uh, it was not expected that I would go on and get my PhD and and teach. But um, at 23 years old, after realizing that I needed to go to college for more than playing soccer, I wound up at the school right near your house that you say you'll never go to, thought I was gonna be miserable, walked into a political philosophy class and absolutely fell in love with it. I think part of it was I was at an age where I was ready for that. Um, But I had some fantastic professors at William Patterson University in New Jersey at the time, William Patterson College. Uh, Maya Chata in particular, who really helped me understand my own potential and start to grow my own pedagogy. Then to be able to go to a a graduate program at the University of Delaware where pedagogy by many of the faculty there was valued. Um, I had people like Kurt Birch and Bob Danemark and others that took me under their wing and and helped me learn how to teach, which is rare sometimes. Um, So that in the end, I really only had designs on going to a school like Shenandoah because I wanted a place that valued teaching. I knew that was my strength. I knew that's where I wanted to be. Um, And I've embraced that over the years um, and probably embraced it even more so over the past 
mm, five to eight years or so, maybe a little bit longer, where for most of us, say, in terms of our research, we start a new project um, every year getting ready for ISA and we bring that in. What I've been doing over the past few years is trying to take some innovative pedagogical method and bring it into the classroom every year. Some, some big change that I think will both uh, excite me in terms of starting that, excite my students hopefully, um, and keep me motivated to continue to get better in, in the classroom. Uh, and so the past few years I've, I've latched on to a lot of different things, flip classroom, uh, ungrading this year, a whole host of different things that I think have really made me a better professor and a better teacher. Yeah, I'm very interested to hear about all that stuff. The, the flipped classroom in particular, which I know you've been working on in terms of pedagogical professional development and certifications and things like that. Just tell us a little bit about the basics of it, what you, how you adapted it to international studies classes. So the basics behind the flipped classroom are that and the reason I like it so much is it puts a lot of the responsibility of learning back on students rather than on the professor. The first day that students engage in a new topic. So let's, let's bring this back to international studies as an example. Let's say that uh, you're going to talk about, I don't know, nuclear proliferation that week. Um, so when students engage this topic, instead of walking in and having read something and then you lecturing on nuclear proliferation, you will give them um, a short little lecture video. 18 minutes is the perfect amount. Do not lecture 40, 50 minutes. They will not pay attention to it and not listen. And give them an assignment with that. The whole idea is that this, what we call individual space, where the student is engaging the course material on their own, that they're trying to make sense of this on their own. They will struggle. They will not get the answers. When you first do this, they will hate you for this because they're not used to this model. And they will panic because you're giving them an assignment with them and someone will say, but you haven't taught us about this. How am I supposed to answer an assignment? And you have to assure them that this type of assignment is formative, it's not summative, and we're simply looking for them to work through this on their own, work on their critical reading skills, work on their critical thinking skills, work on their writing skills. So that then when they come back and you have your face-to-face -face class, the group space, now you have the time in the flipped classroom to actually have a conversation and discussion about the topic that they already know quite a bit about. And this is where, for me, I employ base groups, groups of four, maybe five students, and they engage in small group discussion in our face-to-face -face classes with the opportunity then to engage me as well. So now they've read about nuclear proliferation, maybe they've read about uh, mutually assured destruction, but they don't quite get it, right? And so I'm asking them questions in class, but now they already have that base of knowledge and they can ask more informed questions of me and I can truly help them take their learning to that next level. I also have a better understanding of what they get and what they don't get because I've looked at their assignment that they handed in. Mm -hmm. So real quick, if you just wanted like what a week would look like for me, I do, I do the latter part of the week as the start of the week actually, that's their online individual space because it gives them more time with the material until they come around to Tuesday. So in a intro to international politics class, Thursday would be the day where they would get the lecture, the readings, the assignment, and they would have till Tuesday to work through that. They hand it in Tuesday morning. I look over the assignments, make sure that what they're doing, what they're understanding, what they're not understanding, craft my questions and the group discussion based on that, come in Tuesday afternoon, have our conversation, work through the problems that they're having with this, clean things up, let them take their thinking to those higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And then we start again on Thursday. And it's, uh, it's been brilliant for me. So what's invaluable about that is uh, because they're in these base groups, um, you're getting some of that leverage where they're teaching each other as well uh, before they get into 
the, whether they venture forth opinions or questions to you in front of the whole class, they can check some of that stuff with each other and, and leverage the information that each other got too. And that's a big part of the face-to-face -face day, the group space day. Um, I typically don't walk in and you know, there's times in the face-to-face -face day that I do need to lecture a bit, but I'll never start that way. Um, what I really want them to do is build off of the assignment that they did, share their findings in the assignment and do exactly what you said, you know, peer to peer learning. You know, what did you get? What did you, you know, how did you work through this? Um, and through a set of structured questions that I have up on a slide in the front of the room, they work through these things and I can walk around and I can listen to what's going on. You know, how they're understanding these things, what the answers are. Did I miss something when I was reading them quickly before we walked into class? All of those things so that then I can then bring the groups back to the whole group and the whole class can have a discussion. So they not only get the benefit of peer-to-peer -peer learning within the small groups, they get the benefit also of bringing those groups together into that larger conversation and having myself in front of the room to assist rather than just lecture at them in terms of learning the material. Yeah. You mentioned the student's reaction to it, right? That often they're going to push back against this because they're expecting from their educational career so far that you're going to give them what they need. How does that, how can you tell when that shift happens when they realize they're the agents of their own education? Well, I think first off, I've gotten much better at preparing them for this, even if they've never done it before. Um, I think it's absolutely critical that professors be as transparent as possible in terms of what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that means that there has to be an intentionality to what you're doing. When I started to run into the initial pushback from students at the start of the semester, I realized I wasn't explaining to them why I was doing this. Mm -hmm. So very early on in the semester, first few days, I push hard in why I'm doing this and say I'm in it again in an intro to international politics class with the student population that I described, meaning mostly non-majors who aren't even in you know, uh, humanities or social sciences, they're in one of the hard sciences, I have to explain to them the benefits of this that go beyond just learning about international politics, mm -hmm. that this does help with critical thinking, that this does help with your critical reading, that this does help with your communication skills, that this does help with your group work. Yep. And they hate that, right? But I tell them, this is what employers want from you. We see the data that comes out of organizations like AAC and you that say, employers want you to be able to work in groups. That's absolutely vital. Yeah. So I've gotten better at that. So my one suggestion to everyone is make sure you do that up front and you don't you know, learn from my mistakes. But that moment of transformation that you're talking about, where they start to realize that they really have agency in this, that, they, that they're controlling their learning, um, it, it really is like a wonderful moment. It's almost an aha moment that you'll see in some of these students where the first couple of weeks, the groups are kind of quiet and they're not quite sure what to do. And you just keep trying to create this informal conversational atmosphere for them. And by week three, week four, week five, the place is just buzzing, right? Like that, you just hear it just humming around you. Um, and students have told me that they really valued the experience for what it gave them beyond the content of the course. Um, and I'm a big believer in that. I, I believe that a lot of, especially at the intro level in whatever discipline it is, it has to reach beyond just, here's what international politics is, here's why it's important. Yeah, um, yeah. They get that as well, but it, it needs to be more than that. So uh, this ties in, of course, to how you're going to assess that. And you mentioned earlier this idea of ungrading, but you got to get to some summative assessment about at some point in order to be able to uh, incentivize some students who may not buy in ever to this whole idea, but also to, to kind of um, help them to realize what they're getting out of the class. How do you do that? So tell me about ungrading. Um, even before 
going headlong into ungrading, which I'm doing this year. That was my big pedagogical move this year. Uh, I had um, I had actually backed off significantly on a lot of the the summative. Um, my favorite assignment that I give to students, uh, and this goes back to transparency um, and intentionality and all of those things, is I give a, an assignment to all my classes near the end of the semester that I call their outcomes assignment. And the outcomes assignment is, I give them the assignment and it lists the course outcomes. Here's what I told you you were gonna get out of this semester. Now you tell me whether you got that or not and show me how you succeeded at fulfilling these different outcomes. Pull things from the classroom. And it's not a difficult assignment. I ask for about a one page write up on uh, just sort of a summary of the outcome and how they think they fulfilled it or didn't fulfill it, and then attach an example to it as well. Uh, and it really is extremely helpful to me and the students for them to be able to reflect on the course and realize that this professor said we were going to learn X, Y, and Z. And at the end of the semester, I feel like I actually learned this. Mm -hmm. But you can see how people at other institutions who may not see the same students over and over again are feeling pressure from their colleagues teaching, say, an upper level course where they, they have to know what realism is. They have to know in order to be able to go on and talk about a criminal justice uh, thing at a higher level in an upper level class. Um, it, it, do you think it still works even if you're not the person teaching them repeatedly? Yes, I think it works because what you have actually taught them to do in a flipped classroom and in a model that might not necessarily emphasize the summative learning and, and assessment that others do. Um, and first, let me say, there's plenty of people that I know that use the flipped classroom that have a lot of summative assessment. Um, and the data shows us that they actually do better on that in a flipped classroom. But for me, one of the biggest things that I'm trying to teach them, and it's actually part of every single one of my syllabi, is the outcome of learning how to learn. Students need to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. If I have taught students in my intro level class how to learn, how to find good sources, how to find information, let's say that they go to another professor's upper level international criminal justice class and they've got to talk about realism and its relationship to sovereignty and issues of genocide. Can they draw back on what I taught them three years ago? Do they remember that? Is it right there that they can draw it out? Probably not. Mm -mm. But I don't think it would even if I had done some major summative assessment on it either. Can they figure out over a 24-hour period how to go back and relearn that stuff, refresh their memory, engage mm -hmm. it, be able to walk into class feeling prepared to have that conversation because they've built the foundation and now they know how to draw from that. Mm -hmm. If they can do that, then I did my job. Right? I mean, I always say, you know, I meet one of my students on the street five years from now and say to them, hey, can you explain to me the, the major principles of social constructivism and its application in IR theory? I don't know about most of you out there, but I'm not real confident that my student's gonna be able to do that. But if I say to them, you've got 24 hours to figure out what the major principles of social constructivism are and how they apply within IR theory, I feel confident that my students would be able to come back and give me a reasonable answer. And that to me is success. And that to me is learning more than regurgitation and rote learning, which is part of more of the traditional model. One of the things I'm really interested in is this concept that your advancement, your what keeps you going kind of as a professional is this investment in something pedagogical each year and that you want to keep pushing on that stuff um, as much as you or perhaps even more in your case uh, that you're doing in terms of the research stuff and, and the 
um, contribution to the disciplinary knowledge base. Uh, how does that? Do you think you're you? Do you think you're weird in that? Do you think that you are somehow that 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 pedagogy is what keeps you going in this discipline? Uh, I did think I was weird for a long time, and I thought I was less than. Um, this is uh, long conversations around the bar at ISA with several of us over the years where we did feel like we weren't necessarily part of the discipline because we hadn't been trained pedagogically. We had been trained to research in that traditional sense. And I did that for a lot of years. But I'll just recall one memory that I have from this going back to ISA and, and a major sort of a legend in international studies. Um, I was fortunate enough to have Yale Ferguson on my dissertation committee, and we became uh, very close over the years. And I was at an ISA conference 15 years ago, probably, um, sulking uh, because I felt like I was less than, that I, my research wasn't up to the standard that it should be and such. And, and Yale bought me a beer said, what's your problem? And so I talked to him about it and, and he laughed. And he looked at me and said, how many books do you think I've written? And I said, a lot, a lot of really good ones too. And he said, you're right. It goes in a lot of articles and people around here know me. I said, yeah, they do. Like you're a legend. And he goes, so who do you think at the end of their career will have affected more people, you or me? And I went, well, you. And he said, no. He said, you will, because your pedagogy, your methods, the students that you touch on a daily basis through all of that, that's just so much more than, in his words, what he was giving to the small circle of global go governance scholars like I was and am. Uh, and it was just, he kind of showed me it was more meaningful. And yeah, it, it is weird, but for me personally, it's why I got into this and it has revitalized my career in some ways. I, I had grown stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one other little tidbit is I, I was part of a faculty fellows group on campus. People will get chosen from around campus to spend one year working on um, a particular pedagogical method. And, and I was chosen as part of the initial group that I could do this. And I worked on flip learning in an online classroom. It was great. It was wonderful. Um, at one point, I looked around at the group. And we added up the time that each of them had been at Shenandoah University. And it didn't add up in total to the number of years that I was there. And one of the faculty members simply said, man, I hope when I've been here, 18, 19 years, like you have, that I'm still this energetic. Mm. Um, and I said, find your passion. And for me, my passion is pedagogy. And that's what, that's what drives me. The, the idea of trying to do better uh, every year and in every class um, and in every moment. And I just, I don't know, I love it. And I love having conversations with you like this and, and all the others at ISA. And so weird, yeah, but I think it's also become more accepted. Um, and I think just podcasts like this are a big part of, of why people have sort of stopped and said, no, this is, this is, this is part of the discipline as well. Yeah. I, you know, international studies is not just the research. It's also the ability to give that to students and, and undergrad students, um, oftentimes not even majors. Yeah. Eric, thanks. This has been fantastic. Uh, it's, it's paying forward that inspiration into how to make sense of that tension that always seems to exist between research and scholarship and, and teaching. And, and so thanks very much for helping us break that down a little bit. No, it was fantastic. Always love talking to you and talking about pedagogy and, and all this great stuff. So this was a lot of fun. Great. Well, we'll see you in Nashville. Absolutely. The Teach and Curve podcast is made available in the International Studies Association Professional Resource Center under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative. You can send feedback or suggestions for future interviews to teachingcurve at isonet.org. 
and follow us on Twitter at Teaching Curve. Please join us Tuesday, March 29th, 2022 for the next Innovative Pedagogy Conference, which will be held in Nashville right before the main ISA convention. Thank you all for joining us on The Teaching Curve, and remember, learn something every time you teach.